Futures Radio Show, sponsored by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world effectively manage risk. For access to free educational tools and resources for the active individual trader, please visit activetrader.cmegroup.com. Every day, traders and investors dive in to tackle the ever-changing markets to find opportunity. Futures Radio Show is your number one source for answers to the questions that all market participants want to ask. Veteran futures trader Anthony Crudelli sits down with the most influential leaders and top traders in the industry. Now, here's your host, Anthony Crudelli. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in for this episode with Terry Duffy. Remember, new shows are posted on Mondays and Thursdays. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes and YouTube. If you're enjoying the show, please leave a review on iTunes. Before I play today's interview for you, I want to give a shout out to the great sponsors of Futures Radio Show. CME Group, Trading Technologies, FTSE Russell, RJO Futures, and Top Step Trader. To learn more about these sponsors and the important things they are doing for Futures Traders, be sure to click on their logos on futuresradioshow.com. Today, I spoke with the chairman and CEO of CME Group, Terry Duffy. I asked Terry if he thought there was a resurgence of the retail trader. We talked about the micros, education at CME Group, what markets he's keeping an eye on, and if he thinks the U.S. is headed for a recession. Last but not least, Terry shares with us how he used to make trade decisions when he was on the trading floor, and he gives new futures traders a piece of advice. So without further ado, let me take you right to the interview with Terry. Terry, welcome back to the show. Well, thank you very much for having me, Anthony. I appreciate it. It's always great to speak with you here at GFLC. Terry, the resurgence of the retail trader. How much has retail trading and futures really been growing? You know, Anthony, I think the way you phrase your question is interesting because you use the word resurgence. I would not call it a resurgence. I would call it more of a, a building of people trying to looking to manage their own risk on their own. Uh, more and more people taking their portfolios uh, much more seriously and being much more active themselves. And so when you look at that, you can classify those folks as retail participants. You can classify them as just managing their money differently. But I wouldn't call it a resurgence. I would call it the education around financial services has gotten so much better in the last 20 years that people are taking responsibility for their own uh, financial needs and how they manage their portfolios. I would agree. And before we go forward, we're going to talk a lot today about the retail trader. How does CME define what a retail trader is? You know, it, it's interesting because a lot of people think that when you define just the word retail, you know, the retail talk about politics. They talk about retail politics. That means going out, shaking hands, kissing babies, that type of thing on retail <laughs> politics. So when you look, think about retail today, you think, well, is retail shopping going down to brick and mortar or is it going on Amazon? So retail is always evolving in different ways. To me, I look at retail and financial services as someone who is actively participating in the marketplace, not someone who is working three jobs, uh, trying to support their family and all of a sudden takes a flyer on cryptocurrencies or takes a flyer on a gold product or something else. That, that's not the retail participant that CME would like to see in our marketplace. We, we think retail participants are sophisticated users that trade more than X amount of contracts, anywhere between 10 and 25 to 50 contracts a day, every day that are actively participating in the marketplace to manage their risk. That's kind of how we define the retail participant. I want to go back to my uh, initial comment when I talked about resurgence. And the reason why I said that is because for me on the futures radio side and the trading future side, I am seeing so many new traders sending me emails. And I've been doing this for several years now. Mm -hmm. And this is the most I've ever seen. And because I work with so many people at CME and I see how much work and effort they've been putting into helping the retail trader with new products such as the micros, uh, tools such as the FedWatch, I guess when I say resurgence, I, I see the way that the exchanges are acting and I see the way that the traders are, are coming to me and, and a lot of my other friends uh, in the industry uh, talking about trading. Why is CME then putting so much effort into education and developing products specifically for 
retail, we'll call it. Well, again, I think we're not designing products for retail. We're designing products that meet the needs of risk management. So when you look at the micros, as you just referenced, Anthony, the valuation of the S&P 500 in 1997 was around 900 S&P uh, valuation. Today, it's over 3,000, as you know. So when you look at just the appreciation of the index in of itself going up multiple folds, and then the contract gets extremely large. So in 97, we took the multiplier from 500 to 250 on the S&P 500, and we created an E-mini on top of it. And that's become a very popular risk management tool. So now you create the micro contract of, which is one-tenth the size of an E-mini, and you say, well, geez, you just created a micro contract. I don't know if I would agree with that. I think we created a contract for certain people's needs to manage their risk in their portfolio, no different than we did in 1997 with the E-mini and cutting the multiplier from 500 to 250 on the big S&P. So it sounds to me as though you're seeing the demand for these products and you're creating products for those traders, for those types of traders. We're creating products for people to manage their risk. Now, where that falls in the spectrum of... Uh, how you classify uh, an institutional participant, a commercial participant, a retail participant is a different story because you can see institutional participants using some of the smaller products because they might be hedging so much of their needs and not 100% of their needs. They might use a, the different products when they want to hedge a different part of their portfolio on the institutional side. So it goes back and forth. So CME's mindset is not to say, okay, what can we design that will attract the retail? That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to attract people that need to manage that risk. And the contract spec sizes go up and down the spectrum, and they have historically, as I just pointed out, going back to 97 with the E-mini. So I think you look at what is in the needs of the participants, and then the participants will fall into the products that they need to trade, whether they're professionals, whether they're retail, as we're defining them, or whether they're commercial, or whether they're institutional. Well, it sounds like good news for both of us. More and more people are interested in futures. Well, I think that is really the answer to the question is more and more people are interested in futures. And I think your question and your, is it, your answer is implicit in your question because that's exactly been the case. So when you look at the growth of futures, let's take the, the U.S. debt market for an example. So the U.S. Treasury market, um, CME in 2011 had 44% of the notional trade of the US debt market. Today, CME has 121% of the notional trade. So why is that? It's more and more people are interested in consolidated pools of liquidity that are much more efficient than fragmented pools of liquidity. And that helps other participants who never used these products before to become educated and participate in them. They, create, they have these deep pools of liquidity so they can manage their risk and they don't have to have huge risk to, do, to manage it. Smaller risks are meaningful to a lot of people and they need to manage it. So I think that's what we've been able to do and we're gonna continually build that method as more people involved in the marketplace. And as I said earlier, they could fit through any one of the constituencies that I referenced uh, a moment ago. Hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying the show so far, but I wanna pause and thank one of our sponsors, Trading Technologies. I started using TT in the year 2000 and I love it. It is by far the best trading platform I have ever used and I've tried a lot of them. With TT, you can trade the global markets from virtually anywhere in the world. They are the world's fastest commercially available futures trading platform. I highly suggest you go try out TT, especially because you can try it for free. Just go to tryttnow.com and set up your account. All right, let's move on and talk about markets, Terry. It's always good to pick your brain and see what you think about the markets in general. Everybody's talking about a recession, Terry. Yeah, they are. And, you know, I have a, a different viewpoint on this. And, Right, wrong, or indifferent, I think every, their opinions are like, you know what, everybody's got one. So uh, <laughs> I think when you talk about recession, you look at the fundamentals of the marketplace. We have record prices uh, on the indexes in the equity. We have record low interest rates. We have um, oil products that are sitting you know, in the mid-range of the $50 a barrel. Um, I'm trying to figure out where the recession's at. We have inflation under 2%. Um, where, where is this recession? Or is just more people who are out of the market 
And if you look at the volumes today, especially on the equities when the markets are rallying, these rallies are going off a of very light volume. The breaks and when they're selling off are on very light volumes, which is telling me that more people are out of the market talking about a recession, looking to buy it back. So all the bulls that I've known for the last 10 years or less or longer, either way you want to look at it, seem to be out of the market, Anthony. So is it a recession or are people talking their own bull kicking to get back in? So that's not for me to judge <laughs> other than I can only go off of the facts. And, it, and it's like anything else. You can only tell me the facts. And the facts are we have record prices that I've just uh, outlined. We have have record uh, inflation uh, growth. There's no inflation. And then you look at what people, the volumes are on the, the markets when they're having peaks and valleys and they're very low, which means to tell me there's a lot of money on the sidelines waiting to get back in. Yeah. And you and I, as traders, we, we watch reactions. People can call for whatever they want. We're not seeing it in the tape. No. And I'm curious, what markets are you currently looking at right now? I look at all of them, unfortunately, but that's uh, part of the job. I mean, I'm very focused on everything that we trade, and I'm focused on with other products that are listed, whether they're ETFs or whether they're cash securities or whether they're derivatives. I'm very focused on all the marketplaces, and I think in order to do my job and for our folks to do their jobs, we need to be focused on these markets. We need to have a good, deep understanding of what's going on. If you, if you don't know what's going on, it's really difficult to walk in to talk to a client and under, have an understanding of what they're doing on a daily basis and not even having a clue what that market is doing. So I'm very focused on markets because I'm focused on the client. I want to grow the business. And I think the only way to grow the business, you better know it. So I, I, I stay focused and I stay very up to date on a, a moment by moment notice, maybe too much of a moment by no, moment notice on what markets are doing, whether they're agriculturally based, whether they're financially based. I think it's important for all of us to uh, that are in this industry to have a, a good feel for the market as well. It doesn't mean we're trading it, but we should at least know what the open interest is doing in a particular product. We should know what the volume of that particular product was on any given day. What caused that volume on any given day? Was it a tweet by the president? Was it a tweet by a, another foreign leader? Was it um, uh, geopolitically generated or was it fundamentally generated? Was it supply demand generated? What caused those price increases or de decreases? And I think if you don't do that, it's really hard to run a neutral facilitator risk management like CME. So I'm laser focused in on those type of things on a daily basis along with running the business. Going back to your trading days, I'm curious, what were the things that you watched to help you make a trade decision? You know, back then it was so much different, Anthony. Um, you're too young to remember, but back then it was a lot different. You know, we had the basic open outcry environment. We were landlocked into trading what we were trading at that given moment in time. So whatever quadrant or pit or ring, whatever uh, your listeners call it back from the day, because we all have a different yeah. phrase for what the trading arena open outcry was called. But in Chicago, we called them the trading pits. Um, you kind of only focused on that particular product. Today, you have the world at your fingertips and in front of you, so it's completely different. So I focused back then just on A, fundamentals, B, a little technicals, and C, a lot of gut feel. And, and you know, back then, I, you know, you could see guys when they were certain types of traders, they would be a two lot, a five lot, or a 50 lot trader, and if they were trading 100 or 200, you could tell that, this guy or this gal has gotten too many, you know, you bought or sweat. sold. You can the sweat <laughs> comes out in a hurry, right? So um, there was different ways to look at markets. Those are gone today. So you need to have, you know, your instincts got to be a little bit different, and you need to uh, rely a little bit on more on technology, and uh, you information. You know, information used to be on the trading floor and flow out to the general public. Today it's completely different. Information comes from around the world, and probably the last people to get at our traders on a trading floor that are still there. Hey, everybody, I want to take a moment to thank one of our sponsors, FTSE Russell. They are a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. The Russell 2000 Index is a key benchmark for small cap U.S. stocks. Be sure to check out the E mini Russell 2000 Index futures, contract symbol RTY. For more information on FTSE Russell and their products, please visit FTSERussell.com. Well, Terry, you're a busy man, and it's always great to speak with you. So uh, last question before I let you go. We talked a lot about retail traders today, but let's talk about just new traders. What advice would you give to the new traders out there listening to this beginning their careers as futures traders? You know, that's a great question, Anthony. And I've said this for a long time only because I – unfortunately saw this in early in my career 
And, you know, you think you have a lot of the answers and you make decisions based on that and it can go wrong. And um, it's a lack of discipline. And I, I lost, I, you know, went broke uh, early on in my career and I was fortunate enough to rebuild myself uh, over a number of period of years, but I didn't have the discipline that I needed back in the early 80s to participate in the marketplace. So I love new traders. I love talking to new participants. I like talking to university students about a whole host of things in life. And I think when it comes back to either trading or just trying to advance in any career that you may have, whether it's legal, whether it's doing anything in life, if you don't have discipline, you're probably not going to be successful. So I would tell any new participant in the marketplace, you know what, be disciplined because there's an old saying in trading, when you make money, the feeling of making money is you're supposed to do it because it's your job. So it doesn't feel like you've really done any, accomplished anything. When you lose money, it's the worst feeling God ever put on the planet because you lost money because that's your job and now you lost. So in order to accept those feelings and have a part of your trading decisions, you need to embrace discipline and say, okay, I made a trade, I made a dollar, I could have made five, but I made a dollar. Let's go on to the next trade and let's focus on that. I think too many people reminisce or think about what a coulda shouldas. What a coulda shoulda does nothing to put food or put your kids through school. So I think it's really important to stay very focused and disciplined on what is in front of you and don't get too far over your skis. Great advice, Tara. Now, normally I would ask people where uh, people can find them on Twitter. You're not on Twitter, Tara. No, you, you thinking I'm not about on, coming on anytime soon. I'm not on Twitter. <laughs> I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on what's the other one? Instagram. I I'm getting rid of my email. I'm getting rid of uh, my cell phone. I'm going to a flip phone. I'm done. I think we, I think we all need to learn how to communicate better in person. I love going to universities, talking to young people, and the best way to do that is to make sure you don't type it. You get out there and talk about it. Nobody has to be a professional speaker. You should just go out there and talk your mind. And I think we can, again, embrace society and make it go forward instead of hiding behind screens or social media. I'm not, I understand the benefits of social media, but in all due respect, I think we've relied on it a little bit too much. And I would hope that more people that are listening to your show will focus more on, if they're in trading, focus on trading. Don't focus on a tweet that somebody else supposedly did in the marketplace and you should do the same thing because how do you know, how, what's the, wh how viable is that tweet even on uh, the marketplace and why are they the experts? So, you know, Anthony, there's a reason why I, I think it's appropriate for me not to be involved in any of that stuff. You know, again, I think it takes away from the credibility of the institution. Like I said, we're a neutral facilitator of risk. I do not give my opinions on the overall marketplace. I, I don't think it's my place to do it. I'm there to manage the risk of the participants. So I stay away from that type of activity and I try to just stay focused on running the business. Tara, what can I say? Thank you so much for joining me on Futures Radio Show. It's been an honor to speak with you, my friend. Anthony, it's always great to have you down here at our conference and it's always a pleasure to be on your show. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you have any questions or comments for myself or my guests, please visit futuresradioshow.com and sign up to be a premium member for free. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes.